more clear. Never ever Thank you, Senator Brown. The time for safety. this debate has now finished. Just before I move to question time, this morning in my statement I implied that the codes had not been uh, presented to the parliament, but I advise uh, the Senate that they were indeed uh, um, yesterday uh, lodged in the Senate and the House. So thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the words of the late Harry Evans, the longest serving clerk of the Senate, who said, and I quote, the value of estimates hearings in improving accountability and probity of government has long been widely recognised. The hearings allow apparent problems in government operations to be explored and exposed and give rise to a large amount of information which would not otherwise be disclosed. They have come to be recognised as a major parliamentary institution of accountability. Minister, won't the government's plans to axe a full week from the traditional four weeks of Senate estimates lead to less accountability, lower standards of probity, reduced disclosure of information and mean that any problems in government operations are not properly explored and exposed by the Senate? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 I'm waiting to call the minister. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Watt. Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you very much for that question, uh, especially on a day where the House is just censured. The former Prime Minister for Jewel, for Jewel. No, I'm happy to take the questions. You know, you did nine years. You had nine years, uh, and Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Order, order. Senator Cash, Senator Henderson. Senator Dean Smith. Minister Wong, please continue. I'll, ta I'll take the interjection because you're right. You know, the, 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 your, the parliament under you was a parliament which was not respected. Uh, the parliament under you was a parliament because the Westminster system does actually Senator require McGrath ministers to be Scott. accountable through the parliament to the Australian people. Who was the accountable minister in that place? Mr Morrison and another. So don't come Senator in here telling, telling Australians you care about accountability when they saw nine years of cover-up, saw nine years of sports rorts, saw nine years uh, where you refused uh, the basic standards of probity. Minister Wong, now the, uh, uh, I, please I resume know. your seat. Order on my left. Your leader has asked a question. I cannot hear the response. Minister Wong, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and I remind those opposite uh, of uh, some of the, their, their, their standards of accountability. Changing the law to hide significant energy price increases from the Australian people until after the election. Refusing to release the State of the Environment report because it contained too much damning proof of the environment was in a poor and deteriorating Order. state. Uh, and, uh, and of Order. course, something that was refused to be answered in estimates, uh, all of the sports rules questions, which in estimates you never answered. Um, Senator Wong. You never answered. Senator Wong. Now, what I would say to those Senator opposite, Wong. As, as those opposite would know, Senator I was Wong, a great— please resume Sorry. your seat. Order on my left. Order. Senator McKenzie, I have called— Senator McKenzie, I've called the chamber to order. I expect to be able to hear the minister in relative quiet and to stop yelling louder than the minister is speaking. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, I, I knew Ed Harry Evans and I had a lot of respect for him. Uh, and, uh, and what I would remind those is additional estimate statements are associated with MAIFA. We have had a budget and we uh, are having you, estimates minister. associated Your time with has expired. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, Prime Minister Albanese has said again and again and again that the Australian people deserve transparency and accountability. Won't the axing Order. of a full week of Senate estimates lead to less transparency and less accountability? How can the axing of this week be anything other 
than the Labor government taking an axe to government accountability and transparency. Order. Order. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, well, uh, I would invite those opposite, if they want to talk about accountability, to perhaps consider uh, some of what is being disclosed through the Royal Commission into robo debt and the extent. No, and the extent. Well, you know what? You know, it, it is really interesting. You know, Senator Birmingham, aren't you a Johnny come lately? Aren't you a Johnny come lately to this issue of integrity? You were a Senator senior Birmingham. minister in that government. Did you have the spine to stand Senator up McGrath. and tell Scott Morrison he was wrong? Did you have the spine to tell up and tell Mr. Uh, Taylor Senator he was wrong? Wong. You know, you're Senator always Wong. talking, aren't you? Where's the spine? Show up in the leadership. Everyone will know. It's own Senator Wong, resume your seat. We, uh, there's a senator. Order. 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 I have a senator on his feet, and uh, Senator McGrath. Senator Scarf. Uh, President, I, I think uh, the leader of the government uh, in this senator place should. Senator Scar, what is your point? Directing comments through you, President, as opposed to gesticulating rudely at the member of the right. opposition and not referring Thank to you, him Senator directly. Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong, please continue. I, I remember how, how long they fought against an anti-corruption commission. I remember how long they fought against yep. that. Yep. And now this man, who is a member of the leadership group, has the temerity to come in here and tell us about transparency. He's discovered it. Now he's on that side. And everybody knows no leadership, no backbone, and a Johnny come lately on transparency. Uh, thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second, supp <laughs> second supplementary. <laughs> Order. This is a most disorderly start to question time, and I'm going to ask those on my left and my right to listen with respect. Senator Birmingham. President, President together with Senators Babette, Hanson, Lambie, Pocock, Roberts, and Tyrrell, I have just written to Senator Wong. And Minister, indicating that we do not accept the arguments put forward by the government to defend its cutting of Senate estimates, and that we will not be in a position to support the proposed sitting schedule for 2023. If, as you say, you're all for transparency, accountability and respect of the parliament, will you listen to the crossbench senators and the opposition and revisit your decision to axe this estimates week? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Wong, please wait for the call. Senator Wong. Uh, th th thank you, President. Uh, it's interesting how quickly uh, conventions which we observe for nine years are junked by those opposite. Oh, no, let, me, let me just finish this. For nine years, the Greens moved amendments to your sitting pattern, which we never supported. Oh, it didn't take you very long, did it? Didn't take you very long. There are a few other conventions Order. in this place if you want to go down this path. There are a few other conventions that we can go down this path. The my my additional list. estimates are for the purpose of examining the estimates from my EFO. That is actually what they are for. Uh, and we have, we have. Do you want order? Order, Senator Cash. I'm calling your side in. Uh, Senator Watt. I'm waiting for quiet until I call the minister back again. Minister. Uh, as I said, uh, the additional estimates have been for the purpose of examining a, a mid-year economic and fiscal uh, outlook update. We, uh, a technicality, it's because the constitutionally the, the budget appropriate. Oh. Would you like to answer the question? Maybe, Senator, you didn't answer the questions in government. Would you like to answer them now? Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Before I call you, Senator Dodson, it would seem to be an appropriate time to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the Gallery of Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, Chair of the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force Kerry Hartland and the Secretariat. On behalf of all senators, I welcome you to the Senate. Senator Dodson. Senator McGrath, I have a senator waiting 
to ask a question. Senator uh, Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, can the Minister update the Senate on the findings of the Closing the Gap report? Minister. Uh, I thank Senator Dodson for his question. I thank him for his leadership in this parliament and his leadership for Australians, uh, First Nations peoples and non-Indigenous Australians for decades. Uh, today, the Prime Minister tabled the Commonwealth Closing the Gap Annual Report 2022, and regrettably, deeply regrettably, the progress is, mi progress is mixed, with only four out of the nine targets for which we have updated data being on track. There is some good news, some areas where we are on track. More than 89 per cent of babies are being born with a healthy birth weight. That is on track. 96.7 per cent of children were enrolled in preschool in 2021, also on track. But there, have been, there has been unacceptably slow progress in other areas, and some metrics have gone backwards. This includes children being school ready, rates of incarceration, the number of children in out-of-home care and deaths by suicide. For the majority of socioeconomic targets, there is little new data available to reliably, reliably track trends. Work has started to improve this data, so we will have a clearer picture of how we are tracking in future years. But I think we are all obliged on all sides of this chamber to recognise that decades of inadequate government policies have failed First Nations people and have failed to close the gap. We must reverse the entrenched inequality, disadvantage and structural racism faced by First Nations peoples. Uh, and we on this side of the chamber, and I hope all are across the chamber, are committed to doing this to ensuring sustained progress over the life of the 2020 National Agreement and the Commonwealth Closing the Gap implementation, framework, implementation Plan. It is clear that the Closing the Gap architecture can only work if we work together, when there is coordinated efforts from all jurisdictions and, most importantly, in genuine partnership with First Nations peoples. It is only when, we can when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples— Thank you, Minister. Peoples... Your time has expired. Senator Dodson, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, can the minister uh, <clears throat> outline how the government is working to accelerate progress towards closing the gap? Thank you, Senator yeah. Dodson. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Dodson, and thank you again for your contribution to uh, the government's uh, commitments in this area. They include in the October budget $54 million for 500 First Nations health workers and practitioners, $164 million for vital health infrastructure, $33 million to make early education more accessible, uh, and $100 million to improve remote housing, particularly in the Northern Territory homelands. And importantly, and I know Senator Dodson has spoken about this, $81 million in around uh, up to 30 community-led justice reinvestment initiatives to seek to divert young people from the criminal justice system and to reduce crime. Uh, but, uh, President, we must do more. We must do more. And I think what is the a compelling uh, message from this report is why it is so important for uh, First Nations people to be heard and to be part of uh, ensure delivering, designing and delivering thank the you, solutions to this disadvantage. Expired. Senator Dodson, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, can the minister uh, outline how the voice to parliament supports the objective to close the gap? Thank you, Senator yeah. Dodson. Minister. So-called solutions conceived in Canberra and imposed on communities without consultation are more likely than not to end in expen expensive, ineffective and into even counterproductive failure. This is what the Prime Minister said today. But when a government listens to people with experience, with earned knowledge of kinship and country and culture and community, when we trust in the value of self-determination and empowerment, then the results are always better. And that, at its core, the, the Closing the Gap report asks us if we're going to continue to do the same thing whilst expecting a different outcome. Uh, the, the Uluru State from the heart, heart had a humble request at its core. We seek to be heard. It is the same message that we see uh, in this report today. Why it is so important for that hand outstretched, which is the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, to be met generously. Uh, by all Australians. Thank you, Minister. Senator Little. Yeah. President, my question is to the Minister representing the, the Minister for Government Services, Senator Farrell. 
I refer to media reports today that over 1,000 contractors have been axed with little notice just 26 days before Christmas, Shame. with employees quoted as saying, it's not great to get this kind of news right before Christmas. Is this what the government means when they say they want secure jobs for all Australians? <laughs> Good question. Thank you, Senator Little. Minister. <coughs> Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Sen Senator uh, Little for her um, <coughs> her uh, question uh, at this uh, at this time. Um, a number of uh, commercial ICT contracts uh, at Australia, uh, sorry, Services Australia, uh, have recently um, ended their uh, their terms. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the impacted uh, contractors will end in line with the relevant terms and notice uh, period. Um, so, in other words, um, these contracts were uh, coming to uh, to an end uh, in accordance with the, the terms of the contracts, uh, and uh, the government, uh, and in particular, um, Services Australia have. Um, applied the terms and conditions that relate to those um, uh, contracts. Um, these uh, ICT uh, uh, providers uh, have supported Services Australia to significantly um, bolster the ICT systems to meet unprecedented demand uh, on our systems and services during emergencies such as the pandemic, and uh, we do thank them for for their support. Well, well, I, I'll, I'll take that uh, intervention. These these Order. these were Order. contracts. These were contracts that were Senator freely Cash. entered into by the former government. They were freely entered Order. into by the former government. There was a set of terms and conditions, and the government is simply complying with those terms and conditions. Now, I've had some, I've had some experience of what you did with ICT contracts, and I'd like to refer to the PEMS contract, Thank which you, I am— Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Little, first supplementary. Thank you. So clearly you didn't mean them. Given the significant number of job losses, can the government guarantee there will be no reduction in access to services or an increase in any backlog of claims by this decision? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister. I didn't finish my. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Little for her uh, her question. Um, <clears throat> I've actually seen what you've done with uh, ICT uh, contracts, and the perfect example is uh, is the PEMS contract, a contract that was supposed to uh, deliver services for uh, members of Parliament. Originally cost forty eight million dollars. Uh, now up to $66 million and counting, uh, and it's now been referred to the— uh, uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Little. Point of order, President. Um, the question was about uh, reduction in services and backlog. Thank you, Senator Little. I'll draw the minister back to the quest question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Um, Look, I, I'm not. Thank you, uh, President, and thanks for that uh, clarification from uh, uh, Senator uh, Little. Um, essentially, Services Australia consists of um, a workforce that's uh, made up of the, the Australian public service staff. Um, these uh, staff are, from time to time, supplemented by uh, contractors, and that's the people that we're talking about uh, at the moment. These numbers go up and down depending on, um, on uh, uh, government priorities and changing, uh, changing circumstances. Um, and between, uh, uh, your time has expired, Senator Farrell. Uh, oh. Minister, uh, Senator Little, second supplementary. Thank you. Senator Farrell, can you confirm that none of these contractors were working on cyber security programs and projects which would deal with vulnerable Australians' data and that this decision will not see any reduction in the protection of their data. Thank you, Senator Lulu. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, 
uh, thank you, Senator uh, Little. Um, I um, obviously this is not um, my own personal portfolio. Um, I would not expect that there would be any reduction in services uh, through Senator this uh, through this process, um, and particularly as it relates to the issues that you've just uh, mentioned in your uh, in your question. Uh, but I will um, have a chat with the, uh, the minister, and I'll come back to you if, um, if there is any issue different to what I've just uh, said. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Cox. Thank you. Is to Senator Watt, the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. In this government's first budget, $1.9 billion in equity investment was allocated for the development of the Middle Arms Sustainable Development Precinct in Darwin Harbour. Part of this funding is for a common use marine infrastructure. Can the government rule out this port will have a fossil fuel component, such as a gas fed petrochemical hub? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Watts. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Cox, uh, for your question. Um, as you're aware and as you've said, the government will provide $1.9 billion in planned equity to support the development of the Middle Arm Precinct. Uh, in Darwin, together with regional logistic hubs along key transport links. Uh, it is intended to be a multi-purpose uh, precinct, uh, so I'm not at a position at this point in time uh, to rule in particular developments or rule out particular developments, but this investment will enable the precinct to be globally competitive and sustainable, uh, with a focus on low emission uh, uh, production, uh, green hydrogen and critical minerals processing. Uh, demand, as you're probably aware, Senator Cox, uh, is growing for clean energy sources, particularly in the Northern Territory, and Labor's investment will help position the Northern Territory and Northern Australia to diversify their economy and create new jobs. Uh, this investment is not a subsidy for fossil fuels in the way that some people have characterised it. Rather, funding will go towards infrastructure that will support users to export clean energy, critical to meet our commitment to net zero, like green hydrogen and lithium batteries that are critical to decarbonisation. Uh, now, particularly in my previous role as Shadow, Shadow Minister for Northern Australia, uh, I spent a lot of time in the Northern Territory uh, with my good friend Senator McCarthy, uh, along with the uh, House of Representatives members from the Northern Territory, uh, Luke Gosling uh, and Warren Snowden, the former member, and now Marianne Scrimgeour. And I know they are passionate advocates uh, for the Northern Territory to diversify the economy up there uh, and uh, to take advantage of some of the incredible natural uh, and mineral resources that the Northern Territory has. Um, there's, there are extremely exciting projects in the offing in the Northern Territory in that uh, clean energy space, and I think they offer an opportunity to produce lots of very important jobs for that part of the country. You, Minister Watt, Senator Cox, first supplementary. The Northern Territory government's investment website recently changed its description of the Middle Arm project by deleting references to petrochemicals. Did the federal government ask for this public information to be, in fact, edited? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister. <coughs> Uh, well, I don't know what evidence Senator Cox has for suggesting that the federal government may have been involved in this, and I really think that questions as to what the Northern Territory government puts in documents are questions that should be directed to the Northern Territory government. Uh, we're um, not Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cox. On a point of order of relevance, it was about whether the government, the federal government, gave permission for this to be edited. Thank you, Very Senator Cox. The minister is being directly relevant. Minister Watt, please continue. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. As I say, uh, President, uh, questions as to what the content of Northern Territory government documents uh, do or do not contain should be directed uh, to the Northern Territory government. And uh, I mean, it's all very well for the Greens to roll in as they like to do and say, "Did you do this? Did you do that?" Promoting some kind of conspiracy theory without any evidence for it whatsoever. Um, so Order. perhaps Senator Cox Order. would like to present any evidence that she has to suggest that the federal government was involved in that. Uh, I could, uh, so, as I say, this is a really important development for the Northern Territory that uh, the federal government is very pleased to back, uh, and it provides an opportunity for uh, some very important job development in the Northern Territory going forward. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Cox, second supplementary. When I attended uh, COP27 this year in Sharm El Sheikh, I heard about the government's commitment to the protection of mangroves. Darwin Harbour has significant mangroves, 
Uh, how many hectares of mangroves will be destroyed by blasting on the creation of Middle Arms federally funded marine infrastructure? Thank you, Senator Cox. Our Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, I'm very well aware that the Albanese government does take issues of environmental protection, including mangrove protection, extremely seriously. Uh, and we, uh, I know that Minister Plibersek uh, is doing a lot on this front, particularly as the environment minister for that country. Uh, uh, minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cox. Again, point of relevance. Um, a point of order on relevance. How many hectares of mangroves are going to be destroyed? By this marine infrastructure being developed. Thank Very you, Senator question. Cox. And uh, you also referenced COP, and I do believe that the minister is being relevant. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. And again, thank you, Senator Cox. Of course, this development, like every development that is proposed for uh, Australia of the scale of this development, will have to go through an EIS process. Um, that EIS process would consider the very matters uh, that Senator Cox is questioning, uh, and that is the appropriate process uh, in which to make those sorts of decisions based on expert evidence uh, about what all of the environmental impacts of this development would be, whether they be about mangroves or any other uh, feature of the development. Um, so, as I say, and as I have continued to say, this is an important development for the Northern Territory, and it's an important development for the entire country. Uh, we support it. We support the jobs that come with it, and we support the clean energy that will come with Thank it as you, well. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Uh, and in asking it, I acknowledge the early educators, disability workers and hospo workers from the United Workers' Union in the gallery today. Welcome. Yeah. Can the minister give an update on how the government is working across the parliament to progress recommendations from the Set the Standard report? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question and welcome those uh, representatives uh, from the unions um, joining us today and also acknowledge Kate Jenkins and Kerry Hartland and the team from um, supporting the parliamentary leadership task force and of course um, Kate Jenkins is the author of the Set the Standard report and so fabulous to have you here as well. To, today we acknowledge the one year anniversary of the Set the Standard report and its findings that Parliament House was lagging behind the rest of the country when it came to a safe workplace for staff and in particular women. It was all there, gender inequality with a lack of women in senior roles, a lack of accountability in systems, a work hard, play hard culture that left some, particularly young staff and young women, vulnerable to exploitation and sexual misconduct and high levels of power and discretion in relation to employment combined with insecure employment. I would like to thank all of those current and former Parliament House staff who came forward to talk about their experiences working in Parliament. Many of those experiences are harrowing and speaking out must have required enormous strength and bravery. A centrepiece reform from the report is the establishment of a new HR entity body for parliamentarians and their staff to provide independent advice and support and drive an agenda of professional development and best practice training and continuous improvement for staff. The recommendation flowed from the Set the Standard report and staff across the parliament have been consulted on how this new HR body should operate in practice. And I would like to acknowledge the work that's gone in um, by Meg Brighton and her team in the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service, uh, which has made such a difference in such a short amount of time. We know that staff trust it, they like using it, um, and it's been a really welcome addition to the infrastructure here. Cultural change in parliament will only happen when we all work together, and I'd like to acknowledge Senator Farrell, Hume, Davies and Waters for their work on us and joining us on the parliamentary Thank leadership task Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on how Parliament House can work towards becoming a model workplace? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question. Ensuring our parliament reflects the community we serve is critical to becoming a model workplace. The parliament is a different place from a year ago, with the highest number of, on record of women across both houses—38.4 per cent in the House of Representatives and 56.6 per cent in the Senate. There are now 10 women in cabinet, the highest number ever to hold positions in an Australian cabinet. At the heart of the continuing work to become a model workplace is the experience of staff. 
So thank you to all who continue to advocate for change and to your respective unions. Labor strongly supports the uh, creation of a staff advisory body to support the multi-party parliamentary leadership task force and are committed to ensuring that staff voices are heard. Yesterday, the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards tabled their report on codes of conduct. This represents a historic milestone for the parliament, and I acknowledge the Deputy Speaker in the other place for her leadership as chair of the Joint Select Committee. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Can the minister please update the Senate on why these reforms are so critical to improving conditions that will benefit workers in parliament? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, we strongly believe that parliament and the workplace in parliament should lead the country in terms of culture and standards. And we also want to attract the best and the brightest to work in Parliament House. We want to retain them and we want to ensure that they have a positive work experience in this building. Too many bright and hardworking people left with their careers cut short, their mental health affected after experiencing bullying and sexual harassment in, after working in Parliament House. We will only achieve the best outcomes for the Australian people if we have a safe and a supportive workplace for those that serve the public. The parliament has already passed laws to clarify workplace protections and make clear that Age Discrimination and Disability Discrimination Act applies to MOP staff. The implementation of the MOPs Act review will drive systemic change for staff and deliver a professional and modern employment framework, and every one of us has a responsibility to ensure that we achieve what we are setting out to do. Thank, Thank you, Minister. You. Senator Hanson. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Contrary to the claims of Labor Senator Pratt this afternoon, clinical evidence shows that puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones used to treat adolescents diagnosed with gender dysphoria cause negative long-term health outcomes such as reduced bone density and impaired fertility. Does the Albanese government support these treatments being administered to young Australians? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank uh, Senator Hanson for the question. I didn't hear what Senator Pratt, um, what her contribution was earlier, but I um, know that she understands this issue and she has a level of knowledge that probably exceeds most people in this place uh, on the subject. Uh, and so I even without knowing her comments, I have no problem aligning myself with them. Um, I would also say that the well on this issue, on this issue with which I have talked to Senator Pratt, and she has educated me, I take that unusual step. Um, on the broader on the broader question, which you raise on gender dysphoria and the Albanese government's position on it, our position is that every child. And every young person should ac have access to the, all of the necessary supports that they need to ensure they access appropriate health care, regardless of the reason for which they might be um, seeking that care. That is our position. That is a responsible, mature position. This is a matter between young people, their families and the treating health professionals, whatever they might be, doctors psychologists, other health professionals. That is the position that we would take. We also think that every time you know, issues around this get raised, people listen and they hear and, they, and it affects them. And so we also think that there should be a level of responsibility in this chamber to deal with these matters sensitively and carefully because young people's wellbeing depends on it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Um, Minister, in re reference to your comment saying that children and parents are listened to, I'm sorry, talk to the mothers of these parents who have had these puberty blockers. They have no say whatsoever. They're listening to children under 18 years of age. Senator they Hansen, have no say Senator in their Hansen, children. Do so you have a question? The Daily Telegraph newspaper last weekend reported tenfold increase in Australian adolescents presenting the, pu the public gender clinics for treatment for gender dysphoria over the past eight years. Will the minister please explain to the Senate what the Albanese government will do to understand thank you. this Your alarming time has increase? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm not familiar with the article um, that Senator Hanson refers, but I would uh, go back to my original answer, which is that if young people and their families are, are seeking support and assistance 
for health care and health advice through whatever means, if there is an increase in that, that is not necessarily, in fact, that's, that's not a bad thing. I mean, we want people to be accessing the services and care, health care, legal advice, um, you know, mental health support, whatever they need, in order to get the services they want and need and should receive. These are really, really difficult and complex situations that young people are navigating and they need access to the full range of support. If they are accessing those services, then good on them. Um, and I hope their families are getting the right support as well and that they are able uh, to receive the care that they need from a country um, that provides that kind of service for them. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your time has expired. Them. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Thank you. As responsible leaders, we all want the best evidence-based outcomes for young Australians. Will the minister support the referral of these matters for inquiry so the Senate may investigate the causes of this increase in gender dysphoria and explore the long-term health impacts of puberty blocker and cross-sex hormone treatments on Australians' young people. Regardless of the fact of what Senator Pratt has said, it is about having an inquiry so all Australians can hear what's being said by parents, by children, by um, the medical profession as well. Thank you, Senator so Hanson. Be... Your time has expired, Minister. Uh, I understand that's a motion that will be moved later today, and our voting intention um, will be made clear when that question is put. Um, I haven't specifically looked at the referral closely. Um, it doesn't fall under my area of responsibility at this stage, but I, we will have a voting position that is clear on that. Um, but again, I would say these are not necessarily matters that the Senate is best placed um, to determine um, on access to healthcare services. Um, we would ensure, I think the responsibility of the federal government is to make sure that the service system is there and that young people and their families are able to use them if they need to in a whole range of health care circumstances. Uh, Senator Cadell. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong, the minister representing the Prime Minister. Minister, I refer to the secret Labor government report based on October data titled Estimated Impacts of CFPS, Coal-Fired Power Stations and Associated Clo Mine Closures in the Australian Today. Is it correct that this report models regional job losses in the Hunter, projected unemployment, loss of income to local communities, loss of taxation revenue and loss of household consumption expenditure in local communities? And when will the minister and the government release the report in full? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you to the Senator for the question. I, I regret to admit that uh, I may not have read every report in The Australian recently. I find it often uh, better to be selective uh, about what I read. Um, but but I, I would uh, uh, make this point. Uh, what we, we saw under um, the last nine years in the electricity sector uh, is that uh, we saw, uh, I think it was four gigawatts of dispatchable power exit the system, um, uh, only one gigawatt to come in. We saw decisions made by the market. Our Minister, please receive your seat. Senator Cadell. Of order on relevance, this is about a specific government report. Uh, thank you, Senator Cadell. You, your question was extremely wide ranging and it also referred to a report in the Australian order, order. It's not a debating point. You also referred to a report in the Australian and asked the minister to comment that. Minister, please resume. I, I was simply making the point that there have been already closures um, uh, and the market refusing to invest in coal-fired power because of the lack of policy certainty. And I appreciate the tone with which the Senate asked the question, so I'll try not to divert into uh, the, um, the response which talks about the last nine years. But I, I would make the point that, that uh, uh, we, we do believe providing the market with certainty around transition uh, is important. That is the lowest cost way for this transition to occur, uh, unlike uh, you know, it, it, those on this side actually think you, you try to get the market to work uh, rather than having taxpayers fund prop up 
uh, coal-fired power, which was the position that some on the other side argued. Uh, I, I'm not familiar. I, I, I've been up front with you, Senator. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the actual article in question and whether it refers to a... Well, uh, uh, yes. OK, I don't read every article in The Australian, Senator Mackenzie. I apologise. <laughs> No, it's it's Order. just it's not it's, it's it's just not the, the sort of first priority in terms of reading. But anyway, that's that's okay. Uh, but I will endeavour to see. Thank you, Minister. If the your report... time has expired, Senator Cadell. First supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, I again refer to this secret report. Again, named estimated impacts of CFPS coal-fired power stations and associated coal mine closures. From your there, it has been reported in that report. That this secret report shows a spike in hunter employment and local jobs of about 800 jobs. Is this, dis is this distressing news for the Hunter region correct or is it erroneous? Minister Wong. Uh, uh I, I'm not accepting uh, the assertion around secret report uh, in an article that I have been upfront with you, Senator Cadell. I have not read. But I can say to you that the worst thing for communities is a lack of. Um, Senator Wong, please resume your wow. seat. Senator Cadell. I seek leave to table the. Uh, is leave the, uh, the senator report. is seeking leave to table a newspaper article? Is leave no. Report. Uh, I think the answer is no, Senator Cadell. Oh. We're keep it secret. <laughs> Minister Wong. Well, there, there is a. There, uh, if you, if you, order, order. Uh, there, there is. Are you order. Done? Can I keep talking, or would you like to? Make Minister, a please continue. We're always so pleased when you and Senator Red Rennick make a, co uh, a contribution, <laughs> Senator Van. Um, what I was going to say to you, Senator Cadell, uh, two points. One is that there is a usual process for consideration of tabling, which we will observe as a courtesy and a convention. Uh, secondly, I would make the point that what is bad for communities is lack of policy certainty and unplanned uh, exits from, uh, of generation from the system, which is what occurred under uh, the chaos of the previous government. We Correct. have no intention of that repeating. Uh, we are going to ensure we, we deal with this transition, uh, which we have been upfront about, in a way that recognises the need to ensure su uh, you, security of supply time and. Senator Cadell, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, President. Again, I refer to the same document, the estimated impacts of CFPS and associated mine closures. Minister, can you confirm that it's correct that the report is modelled on the assumption there will be a loss of 30 per cent of income for coal fired power station workers and mine workers in the Hunter? And is the Hunter region the sole focus of this report, or is it wider? And is the government got job losses across Australia? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. No, I'm not going to confirm uh, that for the reasons I've articulated previously. And if you, what I would say, what I would say to those opposite is, is this: uh, the majority of the global economy has committed to net zero by 2050. Uh, uh, if we are not in a position to commit in that global economy, that is what will affect Australia's Australia's GDP growth, Australian jobs, and the prosperity of future generations. And I know you all want to think that you can live in the past. We can live in the past Order. and we can go, go back to Order. the 1950s, but if you're committed to net Minister. zero, you're committed to a transition Order. in the Australian economy. The difference Minister. between you and Minister us Wong. is we will have a plan. We will have a plan. We will Minister implement Wong. a plan. We will ensure, we will ensure that we please increase Australia's cost. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Order. 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 I had to call the minister then about five times because there's so much noise in here, my voice can't be heard. I ask you to. Senator Canavan. I am asking you to listen in silence to the remaining time the minister has. Minister. If those opposite are also committed to net zero, I hope they have a plan too, because we have one and we will implement it and we will give people certainty. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. Thanks, President. My minister is... Uh, <laughs> that, could, that could actually be a Freudian slip. 
Uh, <laughs> that could Senator be a Freudian Scars. slip. Senator Scar. <laughs> Order. <laughs> <laughs> President, I, I'm, I might start again. Uh, my question is to Minister Watt, representing uh, the Minister for Home Affairs. And uh, despite the jovial start, it is a serious question, Minister. According to the Department of Home Affairs, there are 92 people who arrived by boat to seek asylum in Australia still stranded on Nauru. It seems from answers in Senate estimates this week that the government has no idea how many have been left to languish in Papua New Guinea and, in fact, couldn't care less. But I can inform the government that that number is 94. Minister, it's been almost 10 years since a Labor government first exiled those people offshore. Why? Will your Labor government not offer those 186 people temporary resettlement in Australia so they can be cared for and supported here while arrangements are being made for their permanent resettlement in a third country? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, this is a very serious question, and I don't think that any uh, Australian is happy about the fact that people have been in detention offshore for as long as they have. Uh, but our government was very clear going to the election uh, that our policy in relation to people on Nauru uh, was that we would support uh, third country resettlement, uh, and that is something that we said a very long time before the election. And the fundamental problem here is that it took so long for the former government to do anything about the resettlement of these people. I mean, we all remember the years uh, that an offer was on the table from the New Zealand government to resettle people from Nauru, and it didn't happen. Uh, if, if the former government had taken up that option of resettling people Order. in New Zealand, we should Order. have been in a position where no one was still in Nauru. But of course, that was not taken by the former government, and that offer from New Zealand remain un remained unanswered. Uh, we are certainly continuing to work uh, with a number of uh, third countries uh, to consider facilitating resettlement, and that remains our policy. Uh, in the meantime, as Senator McKim may be aware, uh, we have also made a commitment to uh, make permanent uh, the very large number of people who are in Australia on temporary protection visas uh, uh, who have been on those for far too long. Uh, and have been left to languish in that situation while on Australian soil. So we are doing a lot of work across a range of visa categories. I was talking yesterday about the work that we're undertaking to clear the visa backlog as well, uh, but our position remains uh, that people on Nauru uh, uh, should be resettled in third countries, uh, and we continue to work very hard with those countries and the people themselves to enable that to happen. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator, um, Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thanks, President. There are over 5,000 people who arrived in Australia by boat to seek asylum since 2013, and over 2,000 of that 5,000 were never actually transferred to either Manus Island or Nauru. People from the same country arrived on the same boat at the same time, and they were separated to totally different futures by completely arbitrary decisions. Why are some of them now worthy of permanent protection in Australia, while others remain abandoned in offshore detention? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Well, thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Uh, and I, I welcome Senator McKim recognising that our government uh, has committed to make permanent uh, the very large number of people who the former government left languishing on temporary protection visas. Uh, that is a position that we always opposed. Uh, we thought it was, we thought it was extremely unfair uh, for people who had been granted those temporary protection visas to remain lacking certainty uh, from year to year. Uh, and of course, there's a, ma a massive ta uh, cost to taxpayers in requiring the regular uh, processing and reprocessing of people on those temporary protection visas. So we are undertaking a lot of work to make that happen. Uh, it's not an easy process because of the, of the sheer number of people who are on those temporary protection visas, but it's something that we remain uh, committed to. Uh, the 
uh, people, of course, who are on temporary protection visas have been found to be refugees and are owed our protection, and that's why our government uh, is committed Senator to McKim. ensuring that they get a, a permanent protection, which is what they Thank should have been Minister, granted in the first place. Expired. Senator McKim, second supplement. It's like an episode of Utopia in this place at times. Minister, nearly a year ago, the Morrison government callously washed its hands of responsibility for the people in that cohort still in exile in Papua New Guinea and abandoned them in a place which is not safe and does not support them. Some of them are dying there now. Will your government reverse that cynical decision and accept responsibility for the people that the Labor Party sent there 10 years ago? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Well, it's good that Senator McKim has been able to get his video through his social media, which is what we know that was all about and what it's always about from Senator McKim. Uh, because if Senator McKim was actually genuinely concerned about these issues, he'd be Order. working with our government Order. to assist our, us to implement the policy that we took to the election. Uh, but we know it's never about the, the facts, it's never about the Senator substance McKim. with the Greens. It continues to be. Minister Watt. Here's Minister some more Watt. video for Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Senator McKim, you have asked your question. I would ask that you listen in silence. Minister, please continue. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I don't need commentary from you either. I've asked for silence. I've asked for silence. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. And as I say, it's disappointing that for the Greens these issues are always more about the social media clip or about the stunt rather than about the substance. Uh, uh, exhibit Minister A, B, Watt. C, D, Minister E, Watt, and F. Please resume uh, Senator McKim, please resume your seat. I have a senator already on his feet. Senator Scar. President, I refer to Senate Order 193 in relation to imputation of improper motives. Yes. Senator McKim cares deeply about this issue. He has a right to ask questions without having, in, in, without having improper motives imputed to him. Uh, Senator Scar, Sen uh, Senator McKim, please resume your seat. Uh, I, on the same point of order? Yep. That was exactly the point of order I was about to make. You're entitled to ask your questions in this place without having your motives impugned in such a way. Uh, that is, quite frankly, a disgraceful accusation from Senator Watt, and he should withdraw it. Um, I'm going to ask both senators. Uh, your, sen your question, uh, Senator Wong, I'm responding. Senator McKim, your question, in my view, was asked in an extremely aggressive way. I do appreciate you have a lot of passion about the question, as do a range of senators in here on the questions that they ask, but in my view it was asked in a very aggressive way. I would remind uh, Senator Watt of the point of order, and I would ask him to uh, answer your question in a respectful way, but I'm asking all senators to listen respectfully as well. Minister Watt. Oh. Senator <coughs> Ruskin. Point of order. The, the fact that the question was asked as to whether the motives of the asker of the question were impugned by the comments by the minister, are you actually not requesting for him to withdraw that imputation. Uh, Senator Rustin, I, what I heard was that Senator Wong. Uh, what I heard, and I am more than happy to look at this on the record, Senator Wong, please resume your seat, was a comment about the party, not the individual. If I'm wrong on that, I will come back and correct to I have I have ruled on that. I don't, uh, Senator Hanson Young. I will come to you. I will come to you. I've got Senator Scar on his feet. So just so that I'm clear, what I heard was a reference to the Greens. Okay. Senator Wong. Uh, I, I understand that Senator Kim has asked the minister to withdraw, uh, and I'd ask you to call the minister. Minister what? Uh, Thank you, President. 
Um, I withdraw any imputation against uh, Senator McKim that I may have made. But the, the point I'm trying to make is these are very serious issues. Um, and Senator McKim knows that not only I, but every member of the government takes these issues very seriously. And that's why we have been putting so much effort into both third party resettlement since taking office and also the processing of people, thousands of people who were left languishing on temporary protection visas when we took office. We will continue to do that and we don't uh, need uh, the sort of performances that often uh, are undertaken in this Thank chamber you, by the Greens. Your time has expired. Senator Billick. Earlier this week, I met with participants in the Pacific Australia Emerging Leaders Summit. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can you tell us how the Albanese Labor government building stronger partnerships with the countries of the Pacific family and the Pacific region as a whole is going? Thank you, Senator Billick. Our Minister. Our Minister Wong, it's your question. I apologise. I, I, I was distracted by a discussion with the leader. I, I, I regret. I will, I will, uh, would you mind repeating the question? And I'll make sure there's additional time post three o'clock. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Billick, please Thank repeat you. the question. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Order. Order. Earlier, earlier this week, Earlier this week, I met with participants in the Pacific Australia Emerging Leaders Summit. So can you tell us how is the Albanese Labor government building stronger partnerships with the countries of the Pacific family and the Pacific region as a whole? Thank you, Senator Bellick. Minister Senator Bellick, and I apologise that Senator Birmingham was and I was so engrossed that I didn't hear a question that I had, in fact, spoken with you about the importance of asking. And, and I, I acknowledge and I will come to them those members of the Pacific family who are here today in the gallery. Uh, we are seeking to build a stronger Pacific family by showing up and listening, by acting on climate change and by boosting our security cooperation and development assistance. Uh, the government's investment in maritime security, climate action, labour mobility, health and education will help our regional partners become more economically resilient, develop critical infrastructure and provide their own security. The investments the Albanese government uh, has put in place will deliver on our commitments to build a stronger and more united Pacific family and a peaceful, prosperous and resilient region. Uh, as Foreign Minister since the election, I've had the privilege of undertaking seven separate visits to the Pacific, uh, visiting 11 countries and, importantly, attending the Pacific Islands Forum in Fiji with the Prime Minister and Minister Conroy, the Minister for International Development in the Pacific. In addition, the Deputy Prime Minister has visited PNG, Nauru, Tonga and Fiji, where he signed a landmark status of forces agreement. Minister Conroy has visited Fiji, PNG, Solomon Islands and last week attended the first in-person Pacific Community Ministerial Conference SPC, since the onset of the pandemic in Vanuatu. Australia is a proud founding member of the SPC, which is the largest scientific and technical regional organisation in the Pacific. Uh, for 75 years, SPC has brought the Pacific together in the Pacific way for members to achieve our shared ambitions and face our shared challenges. Uh, and Mr. I know Minister Conroy was so pleased to represent Australia in this important forum. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. How is the Albanese Labor government responding to the needs and the priorities of the Pacific family? Minister. Uh, thank, thank you uh, to Senator Billick. And one of the things that we have been very focused on communicating is that our partnerships in the region will be guided by Pacific priorities. Communities and leaders across the Blue Pacific have been clear about the impact of the three Cs. This was part of the discussion at the Leaders' Forum at Pacific Island Forum, uh, Leaders' Discussion. The three Cs, climate, COVID and contest. Uh, this is articulated in the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, endorsed by forum leaders this year. And I was very pleased to uh, be with um, uh, Prime Minister Bainimarama and other Pacific leaders in, in, at the UN uh, when uh, this was launched. It is a vision for the Pacific's economic, environmental and strategic future written by and written for Pacific nations and Pacific peoples. At the heart is a simple concept that the Pacific knows best what its priorities are and how to achieve them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you for that answer. Minister, how is the Albanese Labor government elevating Pacific voices on the world stage and supporting Pacific emerging leaders? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
When it comes to climate action, the nations of the Pacific have led the way for a long time. And I remember as climate minister being struck by the power and sincerity of the voice of Pacific Island nations on climate change, well ahead uh, of where the domestic debate wa was in Australia. They have called on us to act, and we have heard them, and we have responded. And we are honoured that all the Pacific Island Forum governments have supported support Australia's bid to co-host with the Pacific COP31. How we deal with the climate crisis is now essential to the future we leave young people and future generations. So I want to acknowledge uh, and welcome the impressive group of Pacific scholars and researchers joining us here today. I pay tribute to the work you are doing to chart a course for your, their, your own futures and the futures of our shared region. Young leaders from, from Fiji, Sa Samoa, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Kiribati, Tonga, Solomon Islands, New Caledonia have been participating in a colloquium through ANU, and we welcome you here today. Thank you, Senator yeah. Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. During the federal election campaign, the now Prime Minister and now Treasurer promised there would be no changes to Australia's franking credits regime. In January 2021, he said, I can confirm Labor will not be taking any changes to franking credits to the next election. Does the recent budget measure titled Improving the Integrity of Off-Market Share Buybacks involve changes to franking credits? Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. It, this, um the measures that were announced in the budget are completely unrelated to the proposed changes to dividends in the 2019 election, which, as those in this place knows, we, we did not take to the, the 2022 election. Uh, Senator Smith, second, uh, first Mr. supplementary. Is it correct that this budget measure will see retirees and investors pay $550 million in extra tax? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. I'll refer the member to the uh, uh, figures outlined in the budget papers. Uh, thank you, Minister Gallagher. Order. Order. Senator Smith, second supplementary. President, the budget measure clearly says uh, $550 Smith, million dollars is this your in second extra supplementary? tax. Was that your second no. supplementary? No, it wasn't. I invited you to make your second supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, President. Can. Oh. Minister Wong. She's got a thing. Order. Jared. Order. Jared, she's got a order. thing for you. Is that Senator standing Smith. order 193? Uh. Um, can, the minister, can the minister rule out further changes to the franking credits regime under this government? And can the minister explain how retirees can trust anything this government says, given its broken promise on franking credits? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. There's no broken uh, promise on franking uh, credits, and the measures that the government has agreed to around um, focusing on tax loopholes. Uh, have been announced in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Senator Farrell. President, uh, during question time, I committed to uh, Senator uh, Liddell to provide additional information, which I now do. Uh, in the cyber security space within Services Australia, uh, there are day-to-day -day operations as well as administrative functions. There were contractors uh, that will be leaving the agency that worked on administrative functions in the cyber security space, but not in the day-to-day -day cyber security operations or hardening of the cyber security systems. Services Australia is confident cyber security will be maintained. Senator McGrath. Take note of Oh, sorry. Senator Watt. In question time last week, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Patterson, uh, sorry, Senator Hanson to me on notice. I've written to Senator Hanson to provide an answer, and I'll now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Are there any other ministerial statements? Senator McGrath. No. Uh, thank you. Mr Deputy President, I rise to take note of all answers to all, all questions. Please proceed. And I'm, I'm going to start with the, the responses from, from Senator Wong to Senator Birmingham's question about estimates and accountability and transparency. And it is clear with, with this, this Labor government that it's, it's not what they do, but it's what, it's what they say. 
and because they're not being transparent, they're not being accountable, but they're saying they are. Indeed, the Prime Minister before the election said that, that the Australian people deserve transparency and accountability. But what we found out in the last, I suppose it's 14 hours, 16 hours, is that this Labor government are reducing estimates, the time for non-government senators to ask questions of the government as to how public monies are expended, that we have found out under Labor's proposals for the sitting schedule in the coming year that they have reduced the estimate schedule by 25 per cent. By 25 per cent. So what the, this, this has overturned decades, decades of convention that there are at least four weeks of estimates each year. Estimates where non-government senators, regardless of who is in power, Labor or, or the coalition, that non-government senators can ask questions of, of the government. And so what we find with this, this Labor government, who have promised, promised transparency and accountability, that they're doing everything but that. Indeed, transparency and accountability have just popped outside this building. Uh, they've called a cab or an Uber, and they're heading to the airport, and they're getting the hell out of. Sorry, they're getting they're getting the heck out of, of, of Canberra, because this is what we're seeing under this Labor government. Uh, we're seeing a Labor government who, for example, with the sitting schedule, promised family-friendly hours. Now, I'm happy to sit here each night to, to, to midnight. You know, my, my family's uh, not, not here in Canberra. Many senators here, their families, most senators, their families are not here in Canberra. Labor promised family friendly hours, Mr Deputy President, but under the sitting schedule, they've made it harder, harder for senators from states like WA, where my colleague Senator O'Sullivan comes from, to actually get home and see their families on, on, on weekends. They've extended the sitting hours. They continue to extend the sitting hours. On this side of the chamber, we, we don't have a, have a problem with trying to assist the government in achieving its legislative program, but we do have a problem with the hypocrisy of a Labor Party who come into this chamber and talk about transparency and accountability and yet do anything but be transparent and accountable. And I, I wonder, Mr Deputy President, is this reluctance to hold four weeks of estimates in calendar year 2023 <laughs> something to do with secrets, something to do with, I don't know, dodgy deals, something that the Labor government don't want us to ask questions about. Because we just have to go through the estimates over the last couple of weeks. And we've found out, for example, through looking at the budget papers and through asking questions of officials at the table, that at that, that jobs fest, in that talk fest that was masquerading as a jobs fest, that this Labor government spent $7,000 on a band. Now, fair play to the band. We all love live music. Brilliant. But they spent $7,000 on a band uh, for an official function. Now, is that a good use of taxpayer money? Taxpayer, Senator O'Sullivan, paid for this. We found that out through the estimates process. But, but is it because the government does not wish us to prosecute and ask questions about energy policy in Australia? Remembering that this Labor government, this Labor Prime Minister promised 97 times before the election that they will reduce your power bills by $275, yet under in their budget papers, we were able to find out, actually, the power bills are going to go up by 56 per cent. So what this government is doing is deliberately limiting the ability of non-government senators to ask questions of ministers as to policies, but also to ask questions of officials as to how public money is being expended. This is about accountability. It is about standing up for the rights of taxpayers who fund the government of Australia and ask on behalf of taxpayers where that money is being spent and is that money being spent appropriately. And what we find out from this Labor Party is that they are scared of transparency and accountability, no matter, no matter the words that come out of them. They all want to go and hide under the doona because they do not like being held to account. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I've got to get the terms right. Because there has been a change of government, and this is the government that is letting the light in and the hypocrisy 
of those who have come in here with this faux outrage about having one week uh, less to review at an event that is not occurring is simply a complete misrepresentation of what is going on. To be clear, my EFO, the mid-year economic forecast and outlook that is provided to the Australian people, we would be familiar with that. It normally happens around Christmas time. And when we return after the Christmas break, the MyEFO document with all of that financial information is then generally subject to review by the process of estimates. That is how it works. But we've had an election this year, people. The government, the former government seemed to have missed that. There was an election, and because their figures were so lacking in transparency, because they were so dodgy and so unclear, like their own leader who has been censured on this very day in the other chamber, like their own leader censured by the parliament in this very parliament today, they try to construct a, a false narrative here about what is going on. The reality is we are all for transparency unlike the government that was under Mr Morrison. And I think Minister Birmingham should be a bit careful with these sort of questions. He, he should know something about this lack of accountability, about the government that he helped to lead. He was the minister representing that Prime Minister, minister Scott, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Did he stand up to him? Did he stand up then? But as recently as a few months ago, Senator Birmingham was part of the cover-up that we have now seen revealed since the government's changed. The transparency that we finally see about a prime minister who was so hell-bent on keeping everything secret that he didn't even tell his own cabinet ministers that he'd taken over five of their jobs. Five of their jobs he'd taken over. Questions. They want to ask questions about a document that does not exist because we just had a budget in October. How many questions did they actually leave unanswered before they left us? It wasn't just parliamentary questions on notice that were left unanswered. The Prime Minister, as he left, had a total of 128 unanswered parliamentary questions on notice—128 that he hadn't answered. Parliamentary questions on notice were just one part of it. The Prime Minister's own department had a total of 391 unanswered questions from Senate estimates. 391. So for this group of members of the now opposition to come in here and say, we need transparency, we need accountability, we agree. So did the Australian people. That's why they turfed you lot out and brought us in. They were sick of the deception. They were sick of the lies. They were sick of the cover-ups, the cover-ups that have become clear since we've come into government, had a look at the books and put out a proper budget in October to let the Australian people know what's really going on with the finances of this country. But that's not the only thing they covered up. And we tried so hard in this place, in this Senate, to hold that government to account. I've got uh, notes from a, a, a matter of public importance speech that I gave last year. And the title of that debate was the matter that the Prime Minister's inability to accept responsibility for any failures and policy stuff-ups that have littered his three years of office. The Prime Minister's answer to the car park rorts. The minister made no decision. His answer to sports rorts. The, he, was, he said that that was misleading parliament. His answer to about an alleged rape in the ministerial wing. No idea about it. His answer to the bushfires that burned homes in my home estate. I don't hold a hose, he said. And his own members were asking him about what was going on with the government and he hid from them that he'd taken over five of their jobs. This is an opposition that has not a leg to stand on in terms of coming in and asking this transparent government that is telling the truth to the Australian people, that's not hiding behind a prime minister who is such a deceiver that he can't even tell his own people what he's doing. The truth has to be told. Senate estimates should follow a, a, a traditional procedure. It should be available to ministers on the other side, or shadow ministers, to ask questions, no doubt. But this, this is a stunt because my EFO doesn't exist. There is really no need for Thank a you, review Senator of a document that will not exist Senator in Van. this year.
Sen Senator Birmingham, please. Senator Van is anxious to begin his contribution. Oh, I am indeed, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, and I rise to take note of the question to Minister Watt um, about power generation, something I know something about. Unlike those on the other side, I spent the best part of my career working in and around the energy uh, industry, so I know something about it. I also would like to take note of uh, Minister Wong's slur against me uh, when she was comparing me with the Senator Rennick. Or, uh, she was in the chamber when I was giving my two-minute speech about my visit to COP27 and how important I thought it was for coalition senators to be there. Now, I didn't see my very good friend uh, um, Senator Rennick there. I know Senator Cox was there, but I, I didn't see her there also. Um, in this place, only a, few, a matter of weeks ago, and when we were debating the, uh, the legislation, legislating of the 43 per cent target, uh, I said in my speech, and I, I quote, uh, and maybe those opposite can show this, um, Hansard to Senator Wong, I said, I'm personally, I am more ambitious than those opposite to what I would like to see our emissions reduction target be. However, I am not blind to reality, unlike those opposite. I believe we need to be as pragmatic as we am uh, ambitious. Now, why am I saying that? Well, it was said by, in JP Morgan's annual energy paper, which explicitly stated that countries that reduce production of fossil fuels under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace them, uh, them face substantial economic and geopolitical risks. If the energy transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generation methods we currently have before we have a replacement for them. And that's what those opposite have not yet addressed. They've talked their plan, which was put together by uh, Reputex, I think it was, when I last worked with them, uh, when I was consulting, they were a polling firm. So I'm sure they've learned a lot about energy policy since then, uh, but I'm not sure how those opposites see that as a viable energy plan. Anyone who starts talking about renewables without talking about firming doesn't know what they're talking about when it comes to energy supply, sovereign energy security and bringing down emissions. The two just aren't the same. None of this can work in isolation. You can't just string wires out to some place out in Whoop Whoop where someone's decided to build a solar farm or a wind farm and think that that's going to give you a good return on your money or not push up power bills. Because I guarantee you it will. The 23 or $24 billion that was in the budget, add a zero to that would be my best estimate, and I'm sure I can find ways to cite that and prove that up. Batteries are not going to be the answer to firming. They're just not. There's no way, there's no, no one that's shown now, and no one at COP was talking about batteries being a grid-scale firming source. Now, they may be in the future. Hopefully, technology will allow them to be. Hopefully, China might still sell them to us at some point. Hopefully, Australia could even be a manufacturer of our own, since we have, uh, we are, produce a lot of the minerals that are critical for batteries. But at the moment, and in the foreseeable future, out to 2030, they are not going to be grid scale. So, JP Morgan's annual energy paper stated putting more renewable energy on the grid will not guarantee lower prices because energy prices rest on an average cost of generation, not just the actual cost of power. No, it's not just the photons or the knots of wind. It's how it's delivered on a continuous supported basis. And that's the bit that we're not hearing from the other side. As AEMO's 2022 ISP states, we need to treble the firming capacity from dispatchable storage, including pumped hydro and gas-fired generation to firm renewables that are coming onto the grid. Now, I do my homework and I've seen and I've found there are actually some Australian companies that are producing firming sources that deserve to be backed 
that might actually provide grid scale firming. There's also uh, Australian companies delivering uh, printed solar that we can put at the source of use, not where we want to run some wires to. Thank you. Senator Chicane. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, and I rise um, just to respond to the line of questioning that have been put by the opposition to the government today with respect to the proposed uh, parliamentary sitting calendar for 2023. Um, so, you know, we come into this place, and yes, it is getting very close to the end of the year. Um, in a week where this government has and looks likely to be passing some significant legislation reforms, not just only with integrity and uh, the NAC bills, but also uh, providing some of the lowest paid workers with some real wage increase opportunities and increase in the productivity in this country. But yet, the op but yet those opposite choose to go down a route of distraction pretending that somehow the parliamentary calendar for next year the, and the way that we conduct ourselves in this place is the biggest single issue of the week. And regardless of what um, they may say, uh, Deputy President, the reality is that a lot of people who be watching this place would be going, what on earth, what on earth are the coalition senators on about? When their cost of living is going through the roof, you lot, you lot, come into this place and use our sitting calendar as somehow the biggest political issue of the day. Talk about being in the bubble. Talk about being in the bubble. And just for the record, Deputy President, as everyone should, always go to the source of the documents. So what I did was during question time, I went and downloaded downloaded last year's, uh, so this year's calendar from the start of the year when you lot were in government. And what I, I can inform the, the, the uh, chamber today is that there weren't four weeks of estimates. There were just three. Just three weeks of estimates. So there is not a 25 per cent decrease of estimates. Your government only proposed three weeks of estimates for this year. Three weeks only. In addition to that, when you compare to what this government's proposal is in this chamber, we are sitting on every single Monday. Every single Monday. Unlike the coalition who had proposed that we sit three Mondays less when compared to the calendar proposed by the government. In addition to this, this government has also put onto the table four additional days on a Friday, if required. Four additional days if required. Then, on top of that, Deputy President, we have an additional week making our sitting calendar for 20 weeks of the year. 20 weeks of the year compared to your 19 weeks. So it's important that we deal with the facts. It is important that we deal with the facts. All you have to do is download the calendar from the start of this year that your lot had proposed and put to this chamber. It is important that we deal with the facts because it is something that the opposition are not very good at doing. They are not very good at dealing with the facts. Um, Deputy President, I also wanted to, uh, also wanted to, to note, um, and I know Senator Birmingham has raised these objections with Senator Wong in the chamber and just made some interjections earlier, but it is the case that there won't be a MyEFO my this year and as been the past practice, there is no need to have that extra week of estimates. That is what the Leader of the Government in the Senate has articulated today in the Senate during question time. That is a very simple explanation as to why we don't have that week of estimates. That is a very simple explanation as to why we're not having an additional week of estimates as per the proposed draft before us today. But it is important that we always look always look at what previous governments have done, but whether they're on the Labor side or the Liberal side, but it is important that we always look at the previous sitting calendars, because it is always important that we look at what the facts are. So I just wanted to make those few short points uh, today, Deputy President, because it is hypocritical coming from the opposition, who also didn't want to sit on Saturday. I mean, they made it very clear they did not want to sit on Saturday, this Saturday, to deal with the, the, the work 
the changes to the Fair Work Day Act, Senator Colbeck, to give the lowest paid workers in this country a pay rise. Your, your side of politics had said no way to sit in longer, no way to for giving low paid workers an increase to their wages. I'm happy to sit here on a Friday. I'm here to sit here on a Saturday as long as the low paid workers get a pay rise, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Senator Coney. Uh, Senator Colbeck. Deputy President, I've got to say desperation comes to the fore, I have to say. Uh, Mr President, there's a pattern emerging here from the government. Uh, they, they talked a big game before the election. Uh, then they come into this, this place having been elected. Uh, they're slip sliding away from their promises, left, right and centre. No mention of 275 in this place from the government anymore. $275 uh, energy price reduction that was promised by uh, the government. That's, that's gone. Uh, and also gone with it, Mr President, is any sense of transparency. Uh, Senator Giacone, he comes and puts on a Se Senator, Senator Giacone, he comes in here and puts on a brave face. Puts on a brave face. Well, I've been here nearly 20 years, Senator Giacone, and I've never seen a year where there's only three weeks of estimates. And, and Senator Giacone, can I tell you, um, additional estimates in February is not just about my EFO. It's about annual reports. It's about a range of other documents that are tabled and published in the public, Parliament, so that the Senate can scrutinise those documents and those processes. That's what it's about. So the government tries to narrow down the target, narrow down the story to suit their rhetoric, but really what's happening is here there is a 25 per cent cut in scrutiny next year. 25 per cent cut. Well, Senator, your maths is pretty your 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 maths is pretty shabby because normally there's four weeks of estimates in a sitting year, and as I said, I've been here a little while and seen a few years and sat around the table for a few years of estimates. Uh, and so a 25 per cent cut next year in scrutiny by this government when normally when normally they uh, and when, when they said they were going to have more scrutiny they wanted to be a more open government they wanted to see more scrutiny mr. president uh, but that's not what we're seeing in practice Senator Wong said during uh, her answer to Senator Birmingham's question that we wouldn't answer question about sports grants and estimates well Senator uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, I sat there through all those estimates, the sports minister, and I answered every question. I, went, I, I underwent, Mr. President, I underwent the forensic questioning from Senator Farrell. Every estimates, the forensic questioning from Senator Farrell at every estimates, and I answered every question. I answered every question. So Senator Wong can make the accusation, Mr. Deputy President, but I was there. I answered every question. So they try to deflect. They try to blame somebody else, Mr. President. But at the end of the day, they're not interested in scrutiny. They're trying to slide from scrutiny, uh, and they and and they talk about they talk about us coming to the chamber, which is the process. They talk about us coming to the chamber with support of other parties around around uh, uh, the chamber, uh, in respect of the sitting schedule, and yet there was no consultation with the opposition, with respect to what the sitting schedule might look like, and in circumstances where there have been major changes or significant changes to the way the schedule looked, there's always been consultation. Now, I don't expect the Senator Ciccone to understand that. He hasn't had uh, that level of experience in that process. I understand that. I understand that. But there have been plenty of occasions when there's been significant changes to the sitting schedule that it's been done in consultation, particularly with the opposition, so that we knew that we could get agreement in the chamber. Uh, and in fact, sometimes under the threat of using the chamber to come in here. But what we have this time, a 25 per cent cut in scrutiny through estimates. Additional Fridays for which there is no standing orders or schedule of programs. So do we get a, sitting, do we get a question time? You can't answer that question. There's no process been undergone there. How come this hasn't been referred to procedure committee so that there can be a process set up in the case that— we, so, so there's no process. No process there. Uh, it is a complete shambles, and the government come in here and try and pass it off. Well, there's no my EFO, so we don't need to do it. So they're not looking at all the processes uh, of the government that are scrutinised at estimates, including annual reports and other reports that are tabled in this place, and the opportunity for senators of all parties across the whole parliament to scrutinise. Uh, and we should have that. We should have that opportunity. We should have that opportunity. Uh, but they talk about transparency. They don't practice it. The secret report that we hear about today about the impacts on the coal industry from the government policies, they don't want communities to understand what the 
impacts of those policies are going to be. So they talk a big game before the election about what might be, what they might do, and they slip, they slide, they try to blame everybody else. A real pattern. It's always somebody else's fault. Could be a department. What was it? We heard the other day it was a typo that it was in in in, in one particular circumstance. Uh, but they're not prepared to provide the scrutiny and the transparency they talked about before the election. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the responses from Senator Watt to the questions asked by Senator Cox and me. Well, uh, Deputy President, uh, it's been almost a decade since people were first exiled to Manus Island and Nauru. And, uh, we should never forget they were exiled there by a Labor government. And now, nearly a decade later, Labor is back in power. But what's Labor actually doing to address the crisis and the human rights calamity, the humanitarian nightmare that it actually started nearly a decade ago? Well, you know what the answer is to that? Nothing. Labor is doing nothing to address it. It's been a decade of murder, rape, child sex abuse, armed assault, the deliberate destruction of countless lives, the deliberate denial of the necessities of life, food, drinking water, electricity, medical support. This has been a foul chapter in our country's story, a dark, dark chapter, a bloody chapter in our country's story. And it's time we wrote the ending to that chapter. But this is a bipartisan policy of cruelty. The people left in Papua New Guinea and Nauru are like the corpses that used to be impaled on the walls of medieval cities to send a message to other desperate people that they should not try to enter. They are human billboards exploited by the Labor and Liberal parties. And what is the Labor Party, the government of the day, doing about this? Absolutely nothing except continuing the cruelty. They continue to wash their hands of the people who were in Papua New Guinea and they continue to abandon the people of Nauru. It's not good enough. This country is a better country than this and the government must do better. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. And my question to Minister Watt was very, very clear about Middle Arm. The sustainable uh, precinct uh, in the Darwin Harbour. $1.9 bi uh, billion dollars we heard uh, he just right here in this chamber given to, uh, through the equity fund. And you heard me talk about how um, the fossil fuels, uh, the 75 per cent emissions that would be released uh, through the Northern Territory on this one project. Now, the name of it suggests that it is a clean energy project. Well, that's greenwashing, we know. And, uh, and actually, it's, it's greenwashing now that's been government endorsed. You know that they are removing words like petrochemicals from uh, websites in the Northern Territory. And the, and the minister couldn't even answer whether they actually had any hand in that. Yet when you go onto the website, it's very clear that they're in partnership: the federal government and the Northern Territory government. So there's been lots of conversations, and when they cop some flack because they go off to COP27 and their minister talks about how great it's been that they co-chaired the Global Climate Fund and helping other nations, but they're not helping First Nations people. Larrakia people in the Darwin Harbour area have rejected this actual project. The lack of consultation is unbelievable. And yet, this government will, say, will not even answer the question about the public information that appears on this website. That miraculously just disappeared. Disappeared weeks ago. And the minister says, oh, well, I don't know where that, how 
that information, he should look at the paper maybe one day and actually have a look and see uh, where that information is, because clearly uh, they may be asleep at the wheel just like the last government were. Um, this was all part of the gas-fired recovery and from COVID. This, uh, this rain project came from. And then we talk about the mangrove alliance. Well, here's Minister Plibersek from the other place coming out, her and Minister Bowen in a, in a joint statement talking about signing up to the International Mangrove Alliance, protecting and restoring, wanting to increase uh, to 20 per cent by 2030, mangroves absorbing more carbon. Well, you can't do that while you're opening up fossil fuel projects in the same precinct. You cannot do that. You are not going to store any carbon doing that. Thank you, Senator Cox. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it.